Finance. I always say that if I had not graduated with a computer science degree, I would have been a finance bro. I love personal finance, and today we're gonna talk about the basics and why it's so important. Last year in May, I graduated from UC Berkeley, and I graduated with literally negative $43,904 of net worth. Today, 15 months later, my net worth is a positive $46,092. I'm not a professional, this is not financial advice, but I love personal finance and all of the tips I'm about to share with you today are things that I follow every day for my own personal finance. I think that following some of the basic advice I'm about to share with you in this video will really set you up for financial success and in the long-term future. This is for all you 20-somethings who have no idea where to start. I promise you'll learn something in this video. If you do, let me know if you want more. I'm here to share. I also want to note that there are chapters on the video playback, so if you want to skip around, feel free to do that but I would recommend you watch the whole thing. Budgeting. You can make budgeting as simple or as complex as you'd like, but you must have a budget. Let's start simple. I'm gonna walk with you through building a simple budget in Google Sheets. First, your budget can be split into three different categories, needs, wants, and savings. Your needs are costs like housing or transportation or groceries or saving up for contacts that you have to buy or healthcare costs, things like that. Your wants are things that you want. The new iPhone, Netflix monthly subscription, eating out, other fun things, concert tickets, things like that. Wants are easy. Your savings includes things like retirement accounts, creating your emergency savings, different brokerage accounts or health savings accounts, all these different types of accounts that contribute to money you're saving for the future. The general advice is that needs should make up no more than 50% of your take-home pay. Wants should make up no more than 30% of your take-home pay, and savings should be at about 20% of your take-home pay. However, a note here, this is just general advice. What I would recommend is if you can keep your needs as low as possible, then you can have more flexibility in your wants and your savings. And that's gonna set you up for success. If we go one layer deeper here, housing should ideally be no more than 33% of your take home income. What you'll see online is general advice that it should be no more than 30% of your pre-tax income. However, 30% of your pre-tax income is like 50% of your post-tax income. That's a lot to be spending on housing. Ideally, if we can keep that lower at about 33% of your post-tax tax income, you'll be in a great spot to make sure that all of your needs combined don't take up more than 50% of your take home. Transportation costs like car, gas, insurance, things like that should take up no more than 15% of your post-tax income. Since I live in Seattle, I don't have a car, which means I can afford to spend a little bit more on housing so that I can live closer to work and use other means of transportation to get me around the city. I'm going to do a breakdown of my personal monthly costs in a little bit and we'll go through here and I can show you what that looks like. But like I said, this is just just general advice, if you cut a little in one area, you can afford to spend a little bit more in another. If you've already moved into an apartment and you're spending 50% of your take home income on that rent, you're not totally screwed. It just means that you won't have as much for wants. Let's list out all of your expenses in your budget under those three main categories. For needs, we should consider all monthly and non-monthly expenses. So monthly expenses like rent or car payment, but there's also non-monthly expenses like renter's insurance, which you may have to Buy to sign a lease, or sometimes different utilities are not every month. Let's also consider your wants here. You may have monthly subscriptions, and you may also have annual subscriptions. You'll want to put both of these on your budget so you can budget a little bit for them each month until that annual subscription comes and you already have the money saved for it. For example, I pay for YouTube Premium, that's about $140 a year. Instead of being blindsided in October when I need to pay for it again, I've saved something like $12 each month so that by the time October comes, I have the money sitting there already. Outside of those monthly and non-monthly expenses, you should also consider setting aside some amount of money for expenses which you don't know when they're going to happen, but they will definitely happen. Let's consider a couple examples. Gifts. I set aside money each month to save for gifts. I'm not buying gifts every month, but my mom and dad are each going to have birthdays. Christmas comes once a year. This is something that I know will come up. Instead of having to spend a lot of my December paycheck on Christmas stuff or kind of being blindsided by a gift, I can save a little bit each month and already have the money there when it's needed. Another example would be if you have a car, you should be saving a little bit each month towards maintenance. You don't know when you're gonna need to spend that, but one day you might just be driving and a flat tire is gonna happen. It would be nice to have some money in a maintenance category set aside for that. It might not cover the whole cost, but it'll help you blunt the impact on your budget. Some other examples would be, do you wear contacts? You'll wanna save up for that each month. So that way when you have to buy six months or your supply, it's not a huge part of your budget. Are you saving 
for a vacation, set aside some money each month. That way we're planning for as much as we can control. Feel free to get as granular about this as you'd like. I like to go granular. Some people prefer to just keep it basic, keep all of this in maybe an emergency fund. But for myself, I have an emergency fund and also all of these other categories to help me plan for the year. To finish out our budget, we'll need to track our income and our expenses, as well as the category that each expense is tied to. For example, if I'm gonna go get some McDonald's, that's gonna be tied to my eating out category. This way, we can track throughout the month how on target we are with our goals, if we're overspending in a category compared to what we would like to be spending versus not. You can choose to use Google Sheets for this. That's a completely free solution. There are other there are apps out there that'll help you with this. Some famous ones include Every Dollar or Monarch Money or Notion. Some people use as well. My personal favorite budgeting app and the one I use every day is called YNAB, Y-N-A-B, and it stands for You Need a Budget. I I love this app, but I'll warn you, it's kind of an intense learning curve and it's a paid app. Everyone can get 34 days for free with no credit card required. If you're a college student, you can get a whole first year for free with no credit card required. I'll leave my referral link. If you sign up, I think I get a month for free, but hey, I'm not sponsored by them. Do what works best for you. And as a guide, I wanna share with you what I'm spending of my monthly income on these various categories. So in my needs, you'll see that I'm spending about 35% of my take-home income on housing, which is more than the 33% I just told you about. Why can I justify this? Because I don't have a car. And so I spend a very small percentage of my take-home pay on transportation. It's only two and a half percent, which is much less than the 15% maximum that I would recommend. Because I don't have a car payment, I don't have insurance, I don't have gas, I don't have maintenance, I don't have any of that. Instead, I allocate a few hundred bucks a month for Ubers and ferries, buses, anything like that. And that's my transportation. In my wants categories, you can see the types of things that I'm planning for. So I plan for those subscriptions, those monthly and non-monthly subscriptions. I also plan for technology because I really love technology. That's like my vice is buying a new piece of tech. I'm currently using a new iPad and I'm really excited about it, but it was really expensive. Luckily, I budget for this. Look, I know that I'm gonna want the new phone or the new iPad, so I budget for it. Like I mentioned, gifts I budget for. Household items, some people choose to budget this differently. For some people, that's like toilet paper and paper towels. For me, that's more like a new lamp or a, a painting or something like that. My self-care includes my haircuts, my like skincare things. I have two travel categories. That's because one, I know I'm gonna go on a trip to Japan next year, 2025, but two, I may also have other travel coming up that I don't yet know about and it might be last minute, it might not, but I wanna save a little bit each month so that let's say I needed to go home to Virginia tomorrow for some emergency, I would be able to cover that without dipping into my actual emergency fund. Lastly, in my investments categories, you'll see that I have three types of investments, my emergency fund, my health savings account, and my retirement account. The recommendation with an emergency fund is that you save between three to six months of your expenses. I have about five months savings Saved up, so I do not need to save anymore. So what I do invest in in my savings is my HSA, which is a health savings account that's a tax advantaged healthcare plan. We will not be talking about that in this video because it's a bit complex, but feel free to look it up. And a 401k, which we will be talking about in this video, which is a standard like retirement account. And I contribute about 29% of my take home income in savings. You'll see that these numbers don't totally add up for 100% of my income. That's because this is what I pay plan for each month. And then I have like a little bit of extra money come in that I can set towards one of my goals. So if I have an extra hundred bucks or something, maybe I put that towards my travel because I want to reach that goal a bit faster. Or maybe I know I'm going to want a new camera lens. So I put it towards technology or something like that. Let's talk about credit cards and debt. Credit cards can be a tricky subject. Some personal finance advisors view credit cards as the devil. They should never be touched. They're horrible. Others are like major maximizers of credit cards. Myself, I like credit cards. I think they're good if you know how to use them correctly. So let's talk about that. First, here's how they should never be used. Credit cards should never be used to buy something that you don't already have the money for in your bank account. They should never be used as a replacement for an emergency fund. And they should never be used if you're already carrying a balance month to month that you cannot pay off at the end of the month. But if you can use them right, they have quite a few advantages as well. First one is that credit cards act as a barrier, some protection for your money. If a fraudulent payment happens on a credit card, you can easily call up that lender and say, hey, 
this was fraudulent. And they'll cancel the charge. But there is a difference between a fraudulent charge on your credit card, which is where they're stealing the bank's money and the bank is going to go after that person, versus a fraudulent charge on your debit card where they've just stolen your money. Credit cards also offer quite a few rewards and perks. At the very simple end, you can find a no annual fee credit card, which will give you like 2% back on all of the spending you have. One card that comes to mind is the City Double Cash. At the more complex end, you'll find cards like the Capital One Venture X, which is a $400 annual fee card. It's a travel card and you get points as miles. They also have other benefits like insurance benefits or no foreign transaction fees, things like that. You can get complimentary lounge access. There's a big range in the types of credit cards you can apply for and get. Like I said, many credit cards offer no foreign transaction fees. So if you travel internationally a lot and you spend with that credit card, you won't have any fees. Some also provide perks like the aforementioned free lounge visits or different insurances, sometimes cell phone protection, things like that. So credit cards can be as simple or as complex as you'd like. You can choose to have one or two cards, have a really good base of 2% back on all your purchases, or you can really get into the like travel game and have 10 credit cards, different hotel credit cards, different airline credit cards, Amex and Chase and all of them can go like that too. But the most important thing that cannot be forgotten is that you need to pay your balance off every month to avoid paying interest or fees. And every perk I just listed is no comparison to the amount you'll be paying in interest if you do carry a balance. It's not worth it. A few definitions to help clear up credit cards. When you first open a credit card, you'll have what's called a billing cycle. And that's usually about one month long. Let's say in this case, that billing cycle is from August 15th to September 15th. Your statement closing date is the last day of that billing cycle. In this case, September 15th. On this day, all clear transactions from the previous month will be summed in addition to any interest or fees you may owed, and that will be your bill. That's how much you owe to the credit card company. To stay current, meaning you're not falling behind in payments, be in good standing to stay current, you need to pay at least the minimum due every month. That minimum due is gonna be shown on your monthly statement. Here's what mine looks like. However, if you just pay the minimum, you're gonna be accruing a lot of interest. Instead, you should pay the full statement balance the entire amount, and that will ensure you pay $0 in interest. You usually have about three weeks from your statement closing date to when your payment is due. So long as you pay within those three weeks, the full statement balance, you will not pay any interest. So in this example, the due date for that August 15th to September 15th billing cycle would be around October 5th. When you apply for a credit card, you'll see something called the APR of that credit card. That is the interest rate you'll pay if you do not pay the full statement balance each month. This usually ranges between like 18% to 30 or more percent, it can be very high. And that interest compounds every day. Let's say that I carry a balance. I don't pay the full statement balance. I carry $500 over to the next month. And let's say that my APR is 25%. After one day, I'll owe $500.34. After a month, I'll owe $510.38. So that would be $10.38 in interest in just that one month. So please pay off the statement balance for your credit card at the end of every month. It will save you so much money. If you can't afford to pay your statement balance at the end of every month, then that is when you should cut up that credit card and not spend another dime on it until you can afford to pay off that entire balance. In the credit card world, you'll hear about the different types of credit cards, the APRs, things like that. But something that will also come up a lot is your credit score. This is your like FICO credit score, which is FICO is the company who creates your credit score. It's made up of five components. The biggest component of your credit score is your payment history, which is 35% of your score. This is basically just how long have you made payments on your various types of credit and are you in good standing? Have you ever missed a payment? Have you ever been late to a payment? Things like that. For this part of the score, just make your payments on time and in full and you'll be good to go. No need to game this. Don't think about it. Credit utilization is the second biggest part of your score and that makes up about 30% of your score. Your utilization is the total amount you owe across all of your accounts divided by the total amount of credit available to you across all of those accounts. So for instance, let's say I have two credit cards. One has a balance of $100 and a limit of $1,000. Another has a balance of $200 and a limit of $500. So our utilization in this case would be the $100 plus the $200 that we're using, 
which is $300, divided by the $1,000 plus the $500 we have available to us, which is $1,500, that is a 20% utilization. For each account, you should aim to have under 10% utilization to maximize your score. Ideally, it should be closer to two to 3% utilization, but under 10% is okay. But for example, we had $100 on a $1,000 total limit card. That's 10% utilization, good to go. But on that second card, we had $200 used out of the $500 available to us. That's a 40% utilization. That's way too high. We need to get that to 50 bucks. If you find that you're utilizing too much of your credit each month, just based on your normal spending, you can always make multiple payments in one month. So if you spend that 200 bucks on that $500 limit card, instead of making one payment a month, you could make a payment right before the statement closes, pay off 150 bucks of that, and then that's your 10% utilization on the statement close date. It'll say you only had $50 used. The next part of your score is your length of credit history. That makes up 15% of your total FICO score. This is calculated by combining the average age of all of your accounts. So let's say for that first example with two credit cards, one of those credit cards I opened a year ago, and the second one I opened six months ago, that is 18 months total divided by two accounts. Nine months is my age. Ideally, the longer the better here. That's why you see people say to never close your oldest account because that is contributing to your length of credit history. The fourth part of your credit score is having a mix of different types of credits lended to you. Someone who just has credit cards will have a lower mix of types of credit than someone who has less credit cards but also a mortgage and also a student loan and also a car payment. They have a variety of different types of credits and that will boost their score. Really though, our goal should be to pay as little in interest as possible. Sometimes it can't be avoided. A mortgage, are you going to be able to save up the entire cost of a house? Probably not. You'll be paying interest. But with things like credit cards and student loans, we should be paying those down as fast as possible. Trying to leave open an account to maximize your credit score because you have more types of accounts open is not worth doing. This is only 10% of your score. So I wouldn't think about this. I'm 22 years old. The only types of credit accounts I've ever had open are credit cards and a student loan. And my credit score sits in the high 700s. Yeah, I, I wouldn't worry. Lastly, anytime you apply for a new type of credit, a lender is likely going to do what's called a hard pull on your credit report. This is so that they can see one, your credit score, but also what type of lender you are. Have you ever gone into bankruptcy or missed payment, something like that? This hard inquiry shows that you're looking for new types of credit. And when you make a hard inquiry, your credit score will go down temporarily. The number of hard inquiries on your account in the last two years contributes to 10% of your FICO score. The impact of this is pretty temporary. Usually you'll see your credit score go down for like three to six months. And then after that, it'll still be on your report for those two years, but it's not really contributing. Personally, I found that when I apply to a new credit card, usually my score goes down 15 points or so for those three to six months and then it recovers. It's not something I worry about. I just try to keep my hard inquiries under like two a year-ish and should be good. So those are the factors that contribute to your credit score. Out of those factors, really the the only ones you need to think about are paying in full and on time and keeping that utilization low. And that's already 65% of your score taken care of. The other things like length of credit history and types of accounts and hard inquiries, those will come with time. Just give it some time and you'll build up a high credit score. If you want to view your credit score for free without any impact to your credit, so not a hard inquiry, you can do so with apps like Credit Karma. I use Credit Karma to show me my credit score. And once a year, you should contact all three of the credit credit bureaus to get a full credit report. This is free and you should do this once a year so that way you can check for any discrepancies on your account to make sure no new accounts have been created that you don't know about, no fraudulent activity, etc. If you do find any fraudulent activity, you can contact the bureau that reported it and let them know and get it sorted and probably freeze your credit. Lastly, for credit cards, I want to give a couple recommendations here on maybe the types of cards I would start with if I was starting my credit card journey again. I would recommend starting with a no annual fee credit card to get used to credit cards to build a history. If you have zero credit history, you may need to apply to what's called a secured credit card. A secured credit card is where you pay the bank the amount of money that will be lended to you. For example, I would pay the bank $500 to open a secured credit card with a limit of $500. Then as you use that credit card and make payments in time and in full, the bank will build that credit history for you as you start off, see that you are a good lender and they usually return that deposit that you made back to you. 
If you already have a little bit of credit history, but you still feel very new to this, I would recommend checking out the Apple Card if you have an iPhone. The Apple Card, I should say, is definitely not the best rewards earning card, but it does give you 2% back on all Apple Pay purchases. And mostly I'm making this recommendation because it is very clear and the different due dates and how much interest you'll pay if you don't pay in full. It has one of the best designed apps for managing the card. It's a no annual fee card with no foreign transaction fees, no fee at all and for newcomers it can be a really great place to start okay so let's imagine that this video should have come out three years ago and you're sitting here with some credit card debt a student loan maybe some car debt feeling in the hole and you're looking for a way to pay this debt off and get out and be financially free let's talk about how we're gonna get you debt free first we're gonna create that budget like I mentioned before we're gonna set aside that 20% for savings towards paying that debt along with anything else you can cut out from your wants or your needs anywhere you can cut we're gonna go full ham on paying this debt off. So let's say that we have the 20% from our savings plus another 5-10% from our wants and we're paying 30% of our take-home income each month towards our debt. The first thing we should do is for all of our accounts we should pay the minimum balance. From there we need to consider whether you have an emergency fund built up. If we don't have an emergency fund then after paying the minimum balance for all of your accounts all of that extra money should first be set aside until you have an emergency fund of three to six months of your expenses. If you don't know what that number is that's okay we have a budget now we're going to be able to see that number over time and then we can kind of extrapolate out from there. The reason you do this is in case of job loss or you break a leg and you need to go to the hospital and you get a bill, you're not going to be going in debt to finance your lifestyle. You'll have a buffer there of three to six months where you can find another job or rest and heal or help you to figure something out before we need to take out more debt. Next, once we have an emergency fund, we can consider how to pay off this debt. There's two methods that people usually talk about and that I would recommend. One is called the snowball method and the other is the avalanche method. Let's imagine we have three different types of debt. One being a student loan with 5% interest and a 20K balance. The next being a credit card at 28% interest and a $2,000 balance. And the last debt being a personal loan at 10% interest and a $1,000 balance. Now that we've paid the minimum across those three accounts and we have some money left over, which debt should we pay off first? This is the question. The most mathematically optimal way to pay these debts off where you'll spend the least amount in interest is what's known as the avalanche method. With the avalanche method, you pick the debt with the highest interest rate of them all, and you pay that one down aggressively. Once that one's paid off, you select the debt now with the new highest interest, and you pay that one off, and so on and so forth. In this example here, we would start by paying the credit card off first, since that has 28% interest. Then we would do the personal loan at 10%, and then the student loan at 5%. However, some folks prefer the snowball method. The snowball method prioritizes the sort of psychological win that happens when you finally pay off a debt. The snowball method is to pick the debt with the least amount of balance and pay that off first and then go neck to next. And so you're kind of snowballing into your biggest debts. In the first example, that would be paying off our personal loan since that has the smallest balance of $1,000, then our credit card at $2,000, and then our student loan at $20,000. By doing this, you'll close each account faster since you're paying the one with the smallest amount of debt, but you will be paying more in interest because we're attacking the account with the smallest balance and not the highest interest. There's not really a right or a wrong way here. I think motivation is going to be the biggest factor for you here on which method you choose. For myself, when paying off my student loan, it took an entire year, 13 months, to pay off my student loan. This is a long game thing. So whatever is going to keep you motivated for 13 months or 24 months or six months or however long it's going to take, that's the method you should do. Next, I want to go over investing and how we should take that excess savings money and set ourselves up for the future. I want to touch on the most common types of retirement accounts and how to automatically invest into the market each month hands off, don't even have to think about it. First, you should be saving for retirement, please, please. And you should start as early as you possibly can afford to. And the reason for this is compound interest. Compound interest is the idea that you earn interest on the interest you've already earned. Why is this magical? Let me tell you. On average, the stock market returns about 7% a year after you factor in things like inflation and recessions and big swings and down swings. 7% per year on average in the long term. So let's say at the age of 22, you invested $1 into the stock market. 
all of the interests and earnings you got back, you just kept it in that stock market and you left it there for 43 years until the age of 65 when you wanted to retire. Because of that 7% year over year compound interest, at the age of 65, that $1 would turn into $18.34. 18X your initial investment. But if we invested that $1 at the age of 32 instead of 22, so just 10 years later, that dollar would only turn into $8.72. That's like a full $10 less pretty much. So the value of $1 at 22 is worth 18x at the age of 65. But just waiting 10 years and starting investing at 32, it's only worth 8x. Isn't that crazy? That's compound interest. That means that every dollar you invest at the age of 22 is worth way more than any dollar you'll invest for the rest of your life ever. So even though you are making the least amount of money you will ever probably make when you just graduate college or you're just a couple years into your career at the age of 22, 23, 24, you should be investing those dollars as much as possible because they're worth so much more than those dollars you'll invest in the future. It's critical to invest early and to invest often and to invest as much as you can, as front loaded as you can. Very broadly, there's three different types of accounts. There's your traditional brokerage accounts, your individual retirement accounts or IRAs, and your 401ks. The IRA and the 401k, we're going to talk about those today. Those are retirement accounts. Traditional brokerage account is not a retirement account. We will not be covering that today. So let's start with an IRA or an individual retirement account. This is a type of retirement account that anyone can open whenever you'd like. You can go to Google and open one up. There's two different types. There's a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. The difference is with a traditional IRA, you invest pre-tax income. You let that invest. And then when you take it out, when you retire, you take that money out and you'll be paying taxes on the money you take out, like personal income tax. But the year you invest the money, so today, you get to invest it pre-tax and you get a tax deduction on that money invested. So let's say our income is $50,000 a year. We open a traditional IRA and we invest $5,000 in that. Our taxed income would only be $45,000 that year. Now that money grows and when we take out money from that account when we retire, we'll be paying taxes on that money we take out. For a Roth IRA, you're putting in post-tax money into that account. It grows over time, but when you take it out after you retire, you don't pay any taxes on that money you take out. So in the same example, we make $50,000 a year. We put $5,000 into our Roth IRA. At the end of the year, we're still paying taxes on $50,000, but that money grows at 65. We take it out. We don't have to pay any money, any taxes on the money we've taken out. To keep it simple, generally the recommendation is if you're in a higher tax bracket now, you should opt for a traditional IRA. That way you can get the immediate tax benefit. But if you're in a lower tax bracket, you should opt for the Roth IRA and just pay the taxes now. So that way in retirement, you don't have to. There's a couple considerations you should make for your personal risk tolerance here. One being we know what the taxes are today. We know the tax brackets. We do not know what's going to happen 40 years from now. Will taxes be higher or lower? If they're going to be higher 40 years than now, then it may make more mathematical sense to invest in a Roth IRA today. If they're going to be lower 40 years from now, then shit, you should have went with a traditional IRA. The problem is we don't know. So consider what you think would happen. And if you feel really strongly one way or another, that might influence your decision. Another thing to think about is the level of taxes you're paying today. For example, I am a relatively high earner. I work in tech, but I live in Washington state, which does not have a state income tax. So even though I have a high income, I don't have to pay state taxes on it. So I'm taxed less than most people in the country making my income. Because of that, I choose to invest in a Roth account myself because even though I'm a high earner, I'm paying less in taxes than most Americans. 401ks are another type of retirement account that are an employer sponsored plan. Meaning if you are not employed or are not full time, Time, you likely will not be eligible to have a 401k. Your employer has to sponsor it. You should ask your employer if you qualify for a 401k. 401ks usually have the same options, Roth or traditional. And with most 401ks, your employer will match a certain percentage of your contributions. For example, let's say the company you work for offers a 401k and they have an employer match of 50% up to the first 5% of your income. What this means is that if you put in 5% of your income to this 401k, the employer is also going to put in another 2.5% on your behalf for you, your money. That's a total of 7.5%. This is free money. You should take it. In this example, for every dollar you invest of the first 5% of your income, you are guaranteed a 50% return. Credit card companies aren't making that much off you. You're not going to get that much in the stock market for a long time. 50% return, free money. Please take it. Once you have opened a retirement account, 401k, IRA, whatever, you will be confronted with a few 
types of investments you can choose from. There are so many, but I wanna keep it simple and, and just recommend one option that I think is best for most people. What I would recommend is something called a target date fund. You'll usually see these as like target date 2065, 2070, 2050, and that year is the year closest to when you'll retire. So I'm 22 and the year 2065, I'll be 64 years old. That is the target date fund I would go for. A target date investment fund is a type of passive fund where you put in money and the company will rebalance that fund. All of the different investments inside, they rebalance it automatically. You don't have to worry about it. And it usually has a collection of different stocks and bonds. And most of them track like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, the total market stock index. What's nice about this type of fund is two things. One, they usually have pretty low fees, but two, they're automatically diversified just by their nature. Target date funds are invested into quite a few types of investments. And that means that we're automatically diversified across the market. Diversification is very important and something you want. And with target date funds, it happens automatically. When you invest into a target date fund, while you're younger, they usually invest in things that have a higher chance of higher reward, higher risk. So that would be like the stock market. And as you get older, the percentage of your money invested moves from the stock market to the bonds, which are much safer investment, less volatility of ups and downs. And the reason they do that is because as you get closer to retirement, you wouldn't want something like a recession totally ruining your ability to retire. And target date funds protect you from this as you age automatically. For most people, a target date fund is a great investment. Try to get one with a low fee, in this case also called an expense ratio of under 0.25%. Whew, okay. That was a lot. I wanna to quickly touch on a couple of things before we head out here. First being, I'm leaving a link in the description to a money order of operations that you can find on Reddit. This is highly helpful. This will help guide you into how you should spend your monthly paycheck, what you should spend on first. The order of operations from you're paid, okay, now what? I highly recommend checking this resource out. It's helped me a lot in my money decisions. I think it will help you too. Next, I wanna quickly say for those who are in debt or feel like they're behind in some way, money things happen on different time scales for everyone. If you're feeling behind, most people feel behind at some point. I surely did. And purely by watching this video and engaging with these topics and thinking about your money and your future, you're way ahead than, than most Americans ever get to. For me personally, I graduated college with $50,000 in student loan debt. And I had, you know, a negative net worth, like I said at the beginning, and I felt very behind. But I also had a lot of support. For the first six months, after college, I lived at home with my parents. I did not have to pay rent or really any money for groceries. Over 80% of my pay at my tech job was going straight towards that student loan payment. And that was a big reason why I was able to pay off my student loan in 13 months instead of 10 years, which it was supposed to take. I was very, very, very lucky to be able to do that and not everyone can. At the same time, sort of putting your life on hold for six months to pay down as much debt as possible is tough. You know, it's a sacrifice when you see your income come in and 80% of it immediately go to the debt collector, right? These are trade-offs. Some of us are in luckier positions than others. I was very lucky to be able to live at home. Others are very lucky in that they don't have to take out a student loan at all, right? We're all in our own stages of life. So just know that you're not behind. I'm rooting for you. Which brings me to my final point here. There will always be pressures, social pressures on, on you to spend more and more and more to have a certain type of lifestyle as you grow and age. If you're not careful, your spending is going to increase to match these different social social pressures. And that's what's called lifestyle inflation. For example, if you're 22 and you just graduated college, the social pressure is to move out of your house. That's one big social pressure. If you if you aren't doing that, then you might feel you're behind. I, I surely did. But once you move out, the social pressure in your 20s doesn't extend much further than that, right? Like it's totally acceptable to be in your 20s and in like a really shitty apartment with like a roommate or two who maybe you don't love making like not great money at your first one or two or three or four jobs. Like these are all acceptable things. But suddenly you move jobs, you make twice as much as you did before. You're 30 now. It's been a few years and now the social pressure changes. Now it's 
not okay to have a roommate or now it's not okay to drive a shitty beat up car. These social pressures change as we age and evolve and you don't want to get caught up in the rat race of trying to live up to these social pressures because you can't. There's always going to be someone who has the flashier car than you or the better whatever. My advice is to stay true to what makes you happy, to invest heavily in those things that make you happy. For me, that is my iPad. <laughs> For you, it might be a car. Even if that's not the best financially mathematical decision, invest and what makes you happy and don't invest in the stupid dick measuring contest that is these social pressures of who has the better house, the better car, the better toy or whatever, the things that don't make you happy. The lower you can keep your expenses, the more you can invest, the faster you can get there to your financial freedom. In many ways, this conversation is literally life or death. It's the difference between a lifetime of security and a lifetime of trying to make ends meet. Stay focused. I'm always happy to do my best to help. If you have a comment, leave it below. I will try my best to share what I know. And I hope others will pitch in to, to share what they know. Anyways, that's it for me. I've been recording this video for 72 minutes now. Huh. So I'm going to go and get a coffee and enjoy the rest of my day. I will see you again soon, I hope. Thank you.